Hello, my name is Maggie Cogswell and I'm the Assistant Digital Projects and Preservation Archivist here at the Washington State Archives. Thank you for attending today. We really appreciate all of you being here. Um, the name of the event today is Preserving Historical Scrapbooks and Creating New Ones That Last. And our host today is Mary Hammer. We will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So put your questions in the chat and they will be answered at that time. So now I'm gonna um, take it over to Mary and she's gonna introduce herself and get our presentation started. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Wave again if you can. Excellent, great. I'm really glad that you've joined us all today to talk about historic scrapbook preservation and creating new ones that will last. Hopefully by the time you leave, you'll be familiar with some of the inherent preservation issues with scrapbooks and have a small arsenal of ways to deal with those issues and then feel empowered to create your own scrapbooks that will last for generations. I'm going to start my um, slideshow now. So first, I would like to pose a rhetorical question to you, and that is, why do we care so much about scrapbooks? In this slide, you see two photographs, and in the first photo, you can see that there are two young women in dresses and saddle shoes. It's very cute. And in the second, we see um, several people gathered around a car, which is a 1929 Chevy. The images alone don't mean very much, but I mean, they're nice photos, but they do lack some significance because we don't know who they are or what they're doing. But in this slide, you can see the context of the photographs in the scrapbook that they originate from. And suddenly, you know so much more. You know that it's May 31st, 1940, and a little bit after 7.30 a.m. in Exira, or Exira, excuse me, Iowa. The two young women in the first image are Maxine, who's at the right, and her friend Marie, who's on the left. The two girls are about to set off across the country on a road trip in the 1929 Chevy pictured in the right. Maxine is headed to Oregon to marry her sweetheart, and Marie just wants a summer getaway. The people in the photograph to the right surrounding the Chevy are Maxine's entire family. They are getting the car packed up for Maxine and Marie to drive across the country. And guess what? The whole family is going to follow behind them as far as Omaha to make sure that they get out of the state all right. I guess that uh, worried parents never change, even from 1940. The entire scrapbook explains their adventure complete with pictures and it has great detail. The scrapbook actually belongs to one of my colleagues at the archives and it was put together by her grandmother. So you can see where having the photographs is important, but then having that context and the scrapbook and the narrative found there makes it so much more important to her. So finding a historical scrapbook can be a treasure trove. Scrapbooks can be a unique record of a subject, place, time, or people. If you have a scrapbook of an individual, you can learn a great deal about their life and personality, not just where and when they were born or died, but how they lived, who and what they cared about, where they went, what they did there, how much things cost, and even how they felt. Usually a scrapbook's creator has taken time and thought to put together a unique artifact or a story. So we want to honor the creator's intent by preserving the scrapbook as non-invasively as possible in order to avoid altering that uniqueness or the creator's intent. So to begin, let's break down the elements of a scrapbook, which will help us later determine how to preserve it. Scrapbooks generally consist of four elements, which are a binding, supports, attachments, and items. So let's take a closer look at each of these elements. The binding is the structure of the book and it's what holds everything together. There are a lot of different ways to bind a scrapbook and here are a few common ones. The one here at the far left is a sewn binding and that's sort of what you see with a typical book or a journal. And then in the middle, we have a laced binding which has holes that go through the front and back cover and then a lace goes through the cover and the supports to tie everything together. This is something that you could easily untie. And then here on the far right, we have a post binding, um, which 
It also has a front and back cover, but it has posts that go through to hold everything together. There are lots of other types of bindings, um, such as adhesive bindings or spiral notebooks or three ring binders. And you've probably seen a lot of those, so I haven't included them here. And so in addition to bindings, we have supports, which are um, the, those, the supports are what the items are actually attached to. So those could be paper or magnetic pages, plastic sleeves or plastic overlays or any combination of those things. And then we have attachments, which are how items are held on to the supports. And attachments could be anything such as Elmer's glue or rubber cement, tapes, pins, paper clips, staples, or photo corners. And then finally, we have the actual items in the scrapbook. And items in the scrapbook can be very diverse. They could include photographs, newspaper clippings, programs, brochures, cards, tickets, that kind of ephemera. Could be pressed flowers, um, fabric. I've seen scrapbooks full of hair. And they could include buttons and coins or artwork. So there's really any number of things that could be included in a scrapbook. And all of those things contain their own specific preservation issues. And as you can see with that array of items, um, scrapbooks can be really complex artifacts with a lot of components to look at when you think about pres the preservation process. So some of the more common issues with scrapbooks would be a strained structure, which would be, you know, you put too many items in a sewn scrapbook and then you end up with a bulging scrapbook that's um, straining the binding. Um, which can be really hard on the scrapbook and the items within the scrapbook because they rub against each other and can cause abrasion or issues. And then you also have the issue of acidic paper. A lot of scrapbooks are filled with acidic paper because after the 19th century, most papers were made with the wood pulp slurry that contains lignin, and the lignin binds fibers together, but it also oxidizes as paper is exposed to light and it can make the paper very fragile and brittle and turn yellow, which you can see in this image on the right. Also, the acid can migrate from items on the, from, from the actual paper onto items in the paper. Um, so you can have something attached to an acidic piece of paper that wasn't originally acidic, but since the acid migrates through the paper onto the item, it then becomes acidic as well and will turn yellow and very, become very fragile. Decomposing plastic is another issue. Certain plastics contain a PVC material, which releases chlorine gases at ages, which causes the plastic to break down, and then it becomes gooey or brittle. And metals are another issue. You can see in the picture on the right that there's a little metal um, paper clip, or where a paper clip used to be that left a stain. Another issue is, excuse me, I can't get my slide to move forward. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Another issue is creeping adhesive. You can see on the image here on the left, um, you can see swipes of glue that was used to paste the image down or the letter down. The, um, any glue that's put on paper can sink through the paper and accelerate acid degradation. So it can stain the paper, it can leak through items and ruin the items that are attached to the paper. And then on the right here, you can see failing adhesive. Um, solvent can evaporate out of adhesives such as rubber cement. And then once the solvent, solvent evaporates, it's no longer sticky and an item will pop right off your page and then it can go missing. And lastly, I don't have an image for this, but um, inks will fade over time, especially when they're exposed to light, heat, or any kind of dampness. So how do we mitigate all of this? 
the very best thing you can do is have a storage environment for your items that works in their favor. Um, ideally, you want to minimize any exposure to light because light will accelerate deterioration and cause papers to become very brittle or to bleach or to darken. And of course, it also causes inks to fade over time, which will alter their legibility. And any exposure to light, even for a brief time, is really damaging. And light damage is cumulative and irreversible. You also want to try to have a temperature no higher than 70 degrees and a stable relative humidity between 30 and 50. Um, when you have temperature and humidity spikes, it causes paper to expand and contract, which make, can make it crack and become very brittle. You also want to have a clean, dust-free location. Pollutants can cause chemical reactions that lead to the formation of acid and materials, which can be a serious problem for paper and leather. Paper can become discolored and brittle, and leather will become weak and powdery. And maybe you've seen this before with leather, but as it deteriorates, it gets what we call red rot, and um, it will cause it to break apart. So also particulates such as soot can damage and abrade materials and pollution that's put out by cars. So that means that garages are not good places to store scrapbooks due to the pollutants that can often be found in garages. You also want to keep scrapbooks away from food, which will attract insects and mice, and they all love to eat paper. And then you also want to store scrapbooks away from water leaks because you don't want water damage on your scrapbooks. Attics and basements tend to have high humidity and temperature fluctuations, and garages contain pollutants. So considering all these precautions, where in the world is a good place to store your materials? We've um, found that a cupboard or closet on, the, on an interior wall of your house works really well. The temperature there tends to be stable, and there's little light exposure and low risk of water damage. Enclosures are also a really good preservation method. Um, a simple acid-free box is really wonderful for protecting an entire scrapbook. And if you purchase one, if you, if you want to purchase a box or an enclosure for your scrapbooks, then this can be one of the, the best things that you can possibly do because an enclosure will save your scrapbook from light, temperature and humidity fluctuations, leaking water or spills, pests, and it can prevent loose items from just falling out of your scrapbook and getting lost. When you're looking for enclosures, you don't want to just use a cardboard box from your Amazon delivery because a regular cardboard box is frequently very acidic. It might be the perfect size, um, but you do want to purchase something that is acid-free and lignin-free. And then the box should be as close to the size of your scrapbook as possible. If there is a little room in your box and the book is sliding around, you can crumple up acid-free tissue. Um, this picture to the right shows some acid-free tissue that's been crumpled up in a box that's a little bit oversized, and it keeps the pages from sliding around in the box and helps keep them protected. You don't need to limit yourself to just boxes. You can also use four-flap enclosures. The picture here in the middle on the bottom shows a good four-flap wrapper, and you just um, wrap up your book in that. You could also just use acid-free and lignin-free paper and wrap up your scrapbook and then tie it with a cotton ribbon to secure it, and that will help keep it away from light and spills and that kind of thing. It's important here to make a terminology note. Um, when you purchase boxes for archival records, um, you, uh, it's important that you that the, that the things aren't labeled just archival because there isn't really a standard legal definition for the word archival. Manufacturers can use the word in their advertising regardless of whether or not the product is actually archival or acid-free and lignin-free. And you do want to make sure that what you buy says that it is acid-free, which means that at the time of manufacture, it had a neutral pH. However, it also means that over time, it can still become acidic. 
So then your extra precaution there is you want to make sure that the item is marked lignin free. Because as we discussed earlier, lignin is an acid found in the wood pulp slurry used to create paper. And over time, it breaks down and causes paper to become brittle. So when you purchase items, make sure that it's marked acid free and lignin free. Another good method to help preserve scrapbooks is to interleave pages with tissue paper. And again, you want to purchase something that's acid free and lignin free. And this will help protect items in a scrapbook that might be damaged by objects on a facing page. For example, if you have an acidic item such as newspapers on one side of your page, and then you have a photographic print on the other side, if you put if you interleave that with acid-free and lignin-free paper, it can help um, prevent abrasion on those items or or it will also help prevent the transfer of acid. Um, and again, when you purchase tissue paper for interleaving, you wanna make sure that it's acid-free and lignin-free. And then we have a few more product terminologies for you. Um, buffered paper is made with an alkaline reserve, which will actually neutralize acid. And this um, gives you the extra protection of minimizing acid migration. And you can use buffered materials with um, anything that may be acidic, such as um, newspapers, documents, black and white photos, or any kind of plant-based materials, such as cotton or linen that you might find in your scrapbook. So if you use a buffered, acid-free, lignin-free interleaving tissue between items, it can actually um, stop the acid migration that might happen. The other type of papers that you can buy are unbuffered. And unbuffered paper is pH neutral, and it's good for interleaving color photos and negatives or blueprints, or if you have any kind of animal proteins in your scrapbooks, such as silk or leather, then unbuffered papers are good to use with that. And then also when you're purchasing interleaving papers, you want to make sure that it says it passes the PAT test if you're using it with photographs. Um, the PAT test um, it was created by the Image Permanence Institute in Rochester, New York, and it just evaluates the possible chemical interactions between enclosures and photographs when you have them in combination with long-term storage. So, purchase PAT tested materials just to ensure that your photos don't, um, don't deteriorate because of the enclosures that you're using. A downside to interleaving scrapbooks can be that it adds bulk to your scrapbook and that can strain the binding. But if you have a scrapbook that has a laced or a post binding, you can simply loosen it. But if your binding is sewn, it's not so easy. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on how to deal with a sewn binding. Sleeving is another good method for preservation in a scrapbook. If you have a scrapbook page that's really fragile and needs more support than an interleaving tissue can provide, then you can just flip it into a sleeve and it will add support or help keep items together if they're falling off of a page. Clear sleeves are really nice because you can see through them, um, but the image is, the item is still protected from the oils on your fingers that could speed up deterioration. Also, the static from polyester sleeves can help paper stay in place if it's been ripped or if something's coming apart. Clear sleeves can also work really well for items that have popped off a page. You can just slip it into a polyester sleeve or for sticky items like stamps, stickers, candy, or oozing plastic that you don't want to contaminate other items in your scrapbook. You can also use paper sleeves, which provide additional support and extra protection from light. They work really well for negatives, hair, or plant matter. And again, if you're using paper sleeves, you'll want to follow the buffered, unbuffered, and PAT testing guidelines, depending on what materials you're sleeping. 
Another method for preservation is stabilization, which means that you would reattach items that have fallen off of a page. And if you do decide to do that, you should only do it if you're really certain of where the item originally belonged in the scrapbook. You can use wheat starch paste to reattach items. It's a reversible paste, and in preservation, we generally prefer to only take actions that are reversible. Um, if you use this, you would just dot it in the corners of your item because if you use too much, it can introduce cockling and then your page will become warped. Another way to reattach items would be using PVA or polyvinyl acetate. Um, it's a synthetic adhesive that isn't reversible like wheat stage paste, wheat, sorry, wheat starch paste, but it has a lower moisture, moisture content than wheat starch paste and it will dry clear. It doesn't yellow or break down over time and it will remain flexible so and it won't affect the pH balance of your paper. And again, you just want to dot it in the corners um, instead of smearing it all over the back of an item just to prevent cockling. Another issue or another option is photo corners um, and these can be polyester or paper and they're self adhesive so they can fail over time but it's kind of a preferred, me preferred method because the adhesive only damages the support, not the item. If your bindings are overstuffed, you can try to relax them by loosening laces or removing blank pages. And this way items will be less likely to rub against each other. Another method is to disbind the scrapbook. And if you have a book with a binding that's so strained that pages are falling out or items are being damaged from the pressure, you might want to actually consider disbinding it. And in this case, you would just remove the supports from the binding and leave the items on the pages. And then you could box, folder, interleave, or sleeve pages as you see fit. Disassembly is an invasive preservation method for scrapbooks. So if you disassemble, you would disband, disbind the book, remove all the items from their supports, and then rehouse the items. It's a really aggressive action, and it could potentially destroy the context and uniqueness of your scrapbook. So you only want to use that option conservatively. And if there are real issues with your scrapbook, such as your supports being extremely acidic and fragile, so that it's no longer holding items, or if you can't touch those pages without causing damage. And before you disassemble, I would recommend taking pictures of the original book and also each page within your book with a camera to create a surrogate, which we'll also touch on a little bit later. And also during disassembly, I recommend numbering each item according to the page that it was found on. And here we have an example of a book that has been disassembled. Um, this was a, a magnetic album that we had in our collections. And before we disassembled it, we numbered each page lightly in pencil. And then we noted each page number on the back of every item that we removed so that we could maintain the original order. And also, we put any numbering that we do in brackets to show that it wasn't written on by the creator of the scrapbook, but by the archivist afterward. And then we scan um, each page of the book so that we have a record of how it looked before we disassemble it. And then you can see here, um, the, this first image shows the scrapbook before disassembly. And then these two images on the right um, show how we placed each photograph in a, in a polyester sleeve. And then um, in the second image, you see that we had taken the newspapers out and put the newspapers in their own buffered folder. Magnetic albums get a special shout out. Um, this assembly is definitely the best option for these. I think that almost every family has at least one magnetic album, and it's usually filled with deteriorating color prints, which is unfortunate. Um, magnetic pages were made with acidic paperboard, which is coated in a sticky wax. 
And they also include a plastic overlay that is the very definition of unstable plastic. So items on these pages are assaulted on all sides with you know, various glues and plastics, and they can deteriorate really quickly. Getting photos out of these pages can sometimes be a problem due to the adhesive. And so photographs can be really stuck to the glue on the pages, and then they can tear when you try to remove them. Um, the Smithsonian put out a really great tip for getting stuck photographs off magnetic pages, and that is to use unwaxed dental floss. And you would set your scrapbook down with some weights over the pages to hold it down while you work, and then slip the dental floss under a corner and slowly work the floss like you see in this image here, moving it side to side, but you don't lift up on the floss or you might rip an image, just keep working it side to side until the image is free, and then you can lift it up off the page. The topic of digitization could take up an entirely new webinar, which we will probably also do in the future. But I just wanted to touch on it and give you kind of the major um, points for digitization. It can't really take the place of an original scrapbook, but there are major benefits from creating digital copies. Firstly, the copies can provide an insurance that the original look intended by the creator will be, serve, will be preserved if you decide to take it apart. And secondly, copies can eliminate the risk of damage, which is inflicted through display and handling of the originals. It can provide a really great way to share it without ruining the original. So um, some of the things that you want to make sure to do if you decide to digitize your scrapbook is that you want to use a flatbed scanner or an overhead camera or just a regular camera. Um, if you use any kind of self-feeding scanners, they can damage the pages or the items pasted on the pages. It helps to number your original pages first before you scan and disassemble. Um, you'll want to demonstrate the creator's original order as clearly as possible. And then when you digitize, you can use the corresponding page number in your file name. A scan resolution of 400 PPI is, is really good, um, especially if you're just trying to make two size prints or um, use it for online access. But if you wanted to, if you ended up wanting to make poster size prints or something like that, then you would want to use a higher resolution. But 400 PPI is great for personal scrapbooks. TIFF file formats are the best for preservation. Um, TIFFs are an uncompressed open format file type, which means that the format is not proprietary and it can be opened by various programs. An uncompressed file means that the file will be, well, the file will retain the maximum amount, maximum amount of digital data that, that, is, that your scanner will capture while you're, while you're digitizing. Files such as JPEG are compressed file formats, and they lose some of the digital data that's captured by a scanner during, during um, digitization. It's also good to name your files with as much information as possible. If you're scanning full pages, you can name the files after your page number. And then while file naming, you want to try to think about the who, what, when, and where that will help you know at a glance what the image might be. The example I have here is um, firstly that it's a scrapbook, so I, I shortened scrapbook, <laughs> and then an underscore for Curran fam, which means that it's the Curran family on my mom's side. And then I put the dates 1934 through 1936, and then the location, the IRE, which is Ireland. And then I used P0001 to indicate that it's the first page of the scrapbook. And that's just an example of how you could do that. Also, digital file preservation is just as important as the digitization end of it. You'll want to keep your original TIFF files somewhere safe as your master copy. And as soon as possible, you want to back up your digital photos in a few separate places. 
Ideally, you would create at least two backups by putting them either on an external drive, on the cloud, or on a friend or relative's computer somewhere else other than where you live. You always want to label media so that it's quickly findable and identifiable. Um, and then every five years or so, you want to migrate your digital files to a new storage medium in order to avoid having your collection stuck on obsolete media, such as floppy disks. Another important thing to talk about is when should you contact a conservator? There is only so much you can do with preservation. Um, if you have issues such as mold or insect damage or items that are stuck together or items that you want to remove any kind of stains or foxing from, that is when you would want to actually contact a professional conservator. Um, the American Institute for Conservation has a really great tool for finding an appropriate conservator in your area, which is over here on the right. And they will only list qualified conservators. And then just as a side note, any kind of conservation or treatment that you do on your own is at your own risk. And I would like to talk a little bit about mold and also items that are stuck together, but I was going to save it until the end. <laughs> during our question time. Um, and, I mean, some of you may or may not care about mold or items that are stuck together. So we'll talk about that, what you can do with those things at the end, with the caveat that you're doing any kind of treatment like that at your, at your own risk, but there are some things you can do. So now I have a little quiz for you guys. <laughs> I just wanted to show a few images of scrapbooks and talk about um, what we see with these scrapbooks here and how you might handle them if they were your scrapbooks. Firstly, I have here um, a scrapbook from the archives. It's a scrapbook showing the Columbia Basin project that happened from between 1933 and 37. And in this scrapbook, there are lots of photographs that are really nicely labeled with what's happening. Um, and some things that I would point out about this scrapbook are that it has a post hinge binding. So if the scrapbook were overstuffed, it could be loosened. Also, I would point out that the photographs here are very yellowed. So they have become acidic. Either they've touched something acidic or they have become acidic over time on their own. And so we might um, find it a good option to interleave these images and pages with buffered tissue paper that has passed the PAT test in order to mitigate the acid migration in the scrapbook. And then here we have um, a scrapbook from Mount Vernon for a proposed soldier's home site. And there are a lot of things going on with the scrapbook. Firstly, you can see in the in the binding here, we've it's a leather binding and it has red rot, so it's deteriorating. There are a lot of loose items in the scrapbook, such as right here we have a stapled some stapled pages that aren't actually attached to anything, and also this loose photograph here that's not attached to anything. And we have some oversized items here, like this panoramic photograph, which has been folded into the scrapbook. So um, with this album, we decided to digitize it and then we removed the pages from, from the binding and placed them in buffered boxes to protect the photographs and um, the acidic papers that were in there. And then also separated the, the panoramic photographs so that they could be in a box of their own and not be folded up and cramped. And then here we have an example of a magnetic album. This album was put together by Muriel Little, who was a Senate hostess at the, at the, at the Washington State Capitol. And so she put together some really fantastic scrapbooks of legislators in session, and um, newspaper articles about the legislature in certain years. And it's really a treasure trove of information. 
from like 1969 into the 80s. And of course, since this is magnetic, we chose to digitize the album first and then um, take everything out of the album and store it separately in, in sleeves and buffered boxes. So that is all I have prepared as far as how to handle historic scrapbooks. Um, so now we can talk about how to create your own scrapbooks that will last for generations. Firstly, to, the first thing to think about is what kind of bindings you would use for your scrapbooks. Ideally, you would choose a binding that could be tightened or loosened at will, because as we saw, a sewn type of binding can become overstuffed, and you don't want to have to deal with overstuffed or strained bindings later on down the road. So you would want to choose something that could expand. Also, you want to choose covers that are acid-free and lignin-free so that the acid won't migrate into the items that you put in your scrapbook. And then as far as support, oh, oh yes. And then you want to avoid any kind of magnetic albums or adhesive bindings or tight bindings. And the problem with adhesive bindings is that they just fall apart really easily. And what types of supports should we use? Um, we want to avoid any craft papers or construction papers because those can be very acidic. And of course, we want to avoid magnetic album pages and anything that contains PVC plastics. The things you can use are acid-free papers that are also lignin-free. Any kind of cotton rag papers are fine. Um, any kind of polyethylene plastics, polypropylene plastics, or polyester plastics are really great to use. And then also, if you have papers at home that you want to be able to use, like decorative papers, um, and you don't know if it's acidic or not, you can purchase something called the Abbey pH pen. And when you mark a paper with it, it will tell you whether or not the paper is acidic. If it turns yellow on the paper, then it's an acidic paper and you shouldn't use it. But if it turns purple, then it's pH neutral and it's fine to use. And I'm not sure how much those are, but I believe they're fairly cheap to purchase. And then lastly, what kind of attachments um, can we use with scrapbooks that will help with our longevity? Ideally, um, when you attach items to pages in a scrapbook, you would use wheat starch paste, which, as we talked about earlier, is, um, is not acidic and it's reversible. You can also use PVA glues, which don't yellow or deteriorate over time. There's also a new stick, glue stick, which I have pictured down here, which is... Um, really good to use. Um, it's, it's, it's like the PVA glue and it, re it retains its flexibility over time and it won't yellow. You can also use things like water moistenable gummed linen tape. And then you can use paper or mylar corners to hold items in your scrapbook. The things you want to avoid are any kind of solvent-based adhesives such as rubber cement or Elmer's glue. Um, you want to avoid pressure sensitive tape or those little adhesive dots that they sell in um, in craft stores because those can become very acidic. And um, also if their their glueiness will evaporate over time. So items can pop right off of those. And then you also want to avoid metal clips and pins because over time those can cause staining on your items. And then what kind of items can you put in your scrapbook? One of the best things to do is use a surrogate. <laughs> if, you have, um, cam if you have images or photographs, if you can just make digital copies of those on acid-free paper, then those are really great things to put into your scrapbook because then you won't damage your original photograph. You'll just be using a copy of it. And then also if you want to use newspaper clippings, it's really great if you copy the newspaper clippings onto some acid-free paper 
and then those will last over time. Newspaper clippings are incredibly acidic and um, can deteriorate really quickly. And then also that acid will migrate into other things in your scrapbook and cause them to deteriorate. So you want to avoid using original photographs or newspaper clippings and try to use copies of those things. Um, inks that you can use, they have archival inks that are permanent and non-fading and they resist light, heat, and water. Um, and those would be things like Pigma pens, which I have pictured here in the middle. And those come in any size point or brush. And so you can do all kinds of um, writing with those and decorating. And then also India ink is really great because it is fade resistant and it works really well for calligraphy or stamping. And um, also I just wanna note that we're not pushing any particular brands or manufacturers. Lots of um, different places will have these items that you can purchase. Um, our main concern is just that you make sure that things are preservation oriented. And here is a slide showing a list of vendors that sell archival materials. And there are more than this. I just wanted to supply you with a list of different places you can go to to find archival materials to use. And you can just use your product terminology to know what things to look for. And that is actually all I have prepared for today. But now I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And if you don't want to stay for the um, Q&A, you can feel free to just contact me by phone or email, which is in the slides that you are able to download on our site. Questions, go for it. <laughs> All right, thanks, Mary. Yeah. Um, I have been following the questions in the chat box, so I'm gonna um, pose a couple of them to you now. Um, Gretchen was wondering about, um, buffered or unbuffered tissue papers is there an unbuffered or, unbu or a buffered tissue paper option there is um when you when you uh, look at, at tissue papers from any of those websites that i listed previously they will say on there if they are buffered or um, as long as they say they're acid free lignin free you're generally safe but um the buffered really helps if you've got photographs or something like that to, to look for that. Okay. Does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. Okay, um, okay we've got a question from Mary Firm. Um, she wanted to know about carbon paper or mimeograph copies. Um, um, I'm not sure if it was a preservation question, but she said, I assume they're acidic, but do they have additional problems? Yeah, they are acidic. Um, and if, if you were going to interleave them, then you would just wanna make sure that if the paper you're using is acid-free and uh, lignin free and you could you could also use buffered um, that would help with the acid migration okay okay we've got a few questions from Rosetta um, is Mod Podge a no-no I've used it before in books I've created sometimes I cover the entire back surface of a photo or other to attach it I have been using PVA because I think it's superior uh, my understanding is that Mod Podge is acidic and that it can cause problems later on down the line. Okay, so Mod Podge is a no-no. Um, any information about Japanese papers like washi paper? Um, I guess all papers should go through the acidic test. Yeah, um, usually the Japanese papers are made with cotton rags, so they're kind of a higher caliber paper, but not always. So you could use the, the Abbey pH pen to test your papers if you already have them. Okay. All right, got another question here from Anne. Oh, I did answer Anne's question. Um, she wanted to know about scanning pages for before disassembling. And I did suggest that using a high pixel camera or um, flatbed scanner as you put in your presentation. Did you have anything to add to that? Um, no, yeah, just don't use a, a, a feeding yeah. scanner. <laughs> yeah. And we have done presentations like this in person talking specifically about how to image um, yeah. scrapbooks. So that might be something we would we could do um, on here in the future. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah. 
Okay, um, we got a question from Sandra. What program would you suggest for a digital scrapbook? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that one. Um, I I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I can I can look into that. So there's a program. Uh, I can't even think of the name of it right now. But I can I can definitely look into that. We have a few people here who li actually like making digital scrapbooks, and um, so I'll check in with them about what they like, and I can contact you. Awesome. All right. Um, let's see. We've got a, Nan a question from Nancy. Is light impression still in business? Oh, that's also a good question. <laughs> I, my understanding is no. All right. But I am not 100% positive about that. Okay. So we got to do more research on that one. Yeah. Okay. We've got a question from Roxanne. If we use surrogates for photos and newspaper clippings for a scrapbook, what should be done with the originals? Does it defeat the purpose of preservation? Ideally, you would be storing your originals um, in either some plastic sleeves that are, you know, or polyester sleeves or paper sleeves to keep them safe and away from light. And then, you know, store them in some archival enclosures to keep them safe. Okay. Okay, question from Gretchen. Um, what's the best recommendation for crumbling edges to to old photo albums. Are there sized sleeves for them? There are. Um, if you go to any of those websites, they sell sleeves that can be, um, that are kind of, well, they sell sleeves that are geared towards common sized pages. <laughs> they, they make some that are 11 by 14. They have some that are like 14 by 14 or eight and a half by 11. So you can find, um, either closely sized or sized, perfectly sized sleeves for those. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, Judith Mosier wants to know, when somebody says it deteriorates quickly, what is quickly? Quickly is usually over a few years. <laughs> and a lot of that can depend on how the item is being treated. If it's exposed to light, it will deteriorate much more quickly than if it's in the dark. So, um, and I don't have a specific timeline on that, but it's also reliant on other things like what kind of humidity or temperature you're dealing with. Um, but it can deteriorate over a matter of like five years. When okay. that's deteriorating. Yeah. Um, from Lauren, will the pastes you listed in the, your presentation work for collaging in the same way as Mod Podge? Is there a Mod Podge substitute? I am not super familiar with Mod Podge um, being used, so I I would say that I mean, if you're just wanting to paste something down, then those work, but they don't coat over the top. If that makes sense. Okay, um, let's see. Um, Judith would like you to repeat some info about testing items for pH. Okay. Um, so we, there's something called the, the Abbey pH pen. I'm going to flip back to it here. There. Um, it's on the bottom right there, the Abbey pH pen. And it can be purchased through any of the vendors that I have listed on the other slide. And I think also you can get them at like Joann's or Michael's. I think I've seen them there before. But basically you just mark on the paper, make a mark on the paper. And then if it turns yellow, it's acidic. And if it turns purple, it is safe to use. Okay, we've got a question from Vic. Um, you briefly mentioned spiral bound and three ring binder scrapbooks when talking about the types of bindings, but is there anything different about working with those binding types that we should consider? Um, I think the, the three ring binders are a good idea because it allows for expansion versus the spiral bound where you're sort of stuck with the, the size of what you purchase. Um, 
And then other than that, you want to consider what kind of covers they have. You want to make sure that if it is a plastic cover, that it's not that it's not one of the bad plastics that's going to deteriorate. And then if it's a paper based or a cardboard based cover, then you want to make sure that it's an acid free and liquid free cover. Okay. Um, Mary said in the comments that she has seen metal staining from three ring binders. So. Oh, right. They make the, they make some of them stainless and those oh. are a lot, a lot safer to use. If you okay. have stainless. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what the question was referring to, but um, Landy wanted to know about matte mediums. Um, matte as in? Uh, M-A-T-T-E. Oh. Um, if you want to elaborate Landy in the chat box and maybe we can help answer that question more specifically. Um, yeah, so, so it looks like that's all the questions we have so far. Um, we'll give everyone a couple more minutes to, to get in their questions before we call it a day. Okay, um, Lynette wants to know, what about using post extenders if original is overstuffed? Yes, that's a great idea. Um, some of the post bound books have extenders that you can purchase um, to, make the, to make the post binding more expansive, and that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. All right. um, Mary, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm glad you came. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Oh, Karen has a question. What about scrapbooks with overlapping layered things on a page? How do you photograph that? Oh. That's the nitty gritty of, of scanning. <laughs> yeah, um, so if you have layered items that you want to show each thing, then what we do here is we, we photograph the page uh, as we see it, and then we take one layer off and take another photograph, and then take the next layer off, take another image. Just through all the things. Black and white? Yeah. Oh, Mary, your thought, your sound was cutting out for a minute there. Let me make sure I'm, can you, is that better? Yes. Okay. I'll just repeat that uh, if you have a page with layered items, you would take a, take a photo of it as you see it originally, and then take off a layer, take another photo, take off another layer, take the photo, just keep until you've gone through all the layers. Okay. Um, Landy um, elaborated on her question here. Matte medium is a pigmentless acrylic paint and is sometimes used instead of Mod Podge. Oh. So, uh, I guess this is a preservation question regarding that. I'm... And unfortunately, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not familiar. I, I would assume that anything with acrylic in it may be acidic, but I don't know that for sure. Okay. Um, let's see, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, is a photo with shadowing from an item on the opposite page improvable or not so much? Um, do you mean in digitization? Um, it seems it seems like the question might be referring to um, a photo that maybe has yellowing from having another item next to it that was more acidic. Is that the question? Where it leaves like a leaves like a mark, a stain. Yeah. Um, usually, if if something has become acidic, it's irreversible. There are things can conservators can do to to make an item unacidic, <laughs> but but generally, once something has been stained, it's it's there's nothing you can do on your own to fix it. You would need to take it to a conservator. Okay. Um, and then Joan wants to know about old baby books. Um, I guess that would depend on the paper and the binding and everything else. What do you think, Mary? Right. Yeah, you would you would treat it like a 
like a scrapbook and um, treat each item in there on a case by case basis. I think if I've seen baby books that have hair and, you know, an extensive array of items. Um, so probably interleaving a baby book with some tissue would be good just to keep items from rubbing against each other. And then keeping it in a box that's acid free. Yes. All right, so that's, got, that's all the questions I have so far. Um, there was some issues with um, our presentation that was downloadable not being the same as the presentation we've showed today. So we're gonna work on getting that fixed for you and then um, we should be able to have that up for you to download, um, if not already. Um, we did have one more question here from Shelby. Is there anything that can be done about foxing? There isn't anything that that you can do without a lot of conservation knowledge. <laughs> if you took it to a conservator, there are things that they can do, but on your own, not so much. And Ro Roxanne wants to know, what is foxing? Foxing is a staining that can happen over time uh, due to acid or, or like if an item becomes partially damp or something, then it can be foxing. It's just a staining on the page. Okay, um, and Christina has a question. How about pictures that are stuck together? Mm -hmm. Oh, good, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I, the way you uh, unstick photos can depend a lot on why they're stuck together. So if they're stuck together due to adhesive, then there are certain gels you can use to edit apart or not you, but a conservator. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, ideally you take something like that to a conservator, but if you're willing to risk your item and do something on your own, then you can kind of make a bath out of distilled water. So say you get, you know, a, a container that's large enough to hold your items yeah, and so yeah. fill it with distilled water, um, which you can buy in the grocery store and then place your stuck items in the water and kind of agitate it with your fingers. And you don't want to leave the items in the water for any longer than say 10 minutes because that can cause damage to your photographs. Um, but you just kind of agitate the water around the items and then gently try to peel it apart with your fingers. Sometimes this can work and um, other times it, it won't. So, I mean, it's not something you would wanna do with something that's super valuable, but if you have like some black and white photographs or some color photographs, um, you can try it with that. And I also wouldn't try it with um, like old dig daguerreotypes or anything like that. Yeah. Um, Vic wanted to, to elaborate. Um, what about photos stuck to acrylic glue? Yeah, that's something I would take to a conservator because they would have um, special solvents to try to get that off. Um, Lynette said, what about freezing photographs, et cetera? Um, I guess it depends on the context. Are you freezing because of mold or? Yeah, let us know in the chat box, Lynette, if you if that's your dampness. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Um, you, can fr you can put items in the freezer if you want to prevent mold from growing because you have damp items. Um, and basically you would just um, wrap the item in butcher paper and tape it up really securely, maybe write the date on it and what it is, and then put it in a freezer for, say, 48 hours. You can leave it longer than 48 hours, um, but 48 hours at least before you pull it out. Okay. Um, Joan says, uh, Joan says, it sounds, is, it sounds like you support scrapbooks for a vacation or a theme or an event. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> we love scrapbooks. Uh, yes. And the more knowledge you have about how to um, preserve them, the better they will be for the long term. Okay, let's see. All right, I think that's all we have so far. Now it's 1101, so I think we're going to probably wrap it up for today. Um, of course, if you have any questions, feel free to contact Mary or I. Um, here at the Washington State Archives. Do you have anything else to add today before we close this up? Um, I have my 
my info here. You can contact me by telephone or by email if you have any questions. I am happy to try to answer. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks everyone for being here with us today. Um, and keep an eye out for more webinars in the future. Thanks for coming.